Good afternoon. I'm Uday Shetty, and you're watching another session of Pharma Best Practices webinar. Today's session is by Tara and Kayur, and they'll be presenting about practical implementation of life cycle approach to process validation. Today's session is the 87th session since we started Pharma Best Practices webinars way back in March 2020. With these sessions, we have reached more than 20,000 professionals who have attended our session live and another 50,000 or so who have watched our recorded sessions. We are pleased that during these tough times of pandemic, we could bring several subject matter experts to present on this platform. And today we have leading experts on process validation. Information about these webinars is available on our website specifically designed for this purpose, pvpw.in, pharma best practices webinars.in. On this website, you can register for all webinars which are planned in the next three months. You can watch recordings of past webinars. You can also read pharma best practices blogs written by several SMEs on very interesting and current hot topics. And if you wish to join, you can join our chat groups where technical subjects are discussed. Uh, today's presentation is about life, life cycle process validation. Uh, life cycle process validation guidance has been published by FDA in 2011 and by PICS and EMEA in 2015. So both these experts will be presenting on this FDA approach to process validation and what is the expectation. Let me say a few words about Tara. She has over 20 years of experience in pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical industries as a statistician, process engineer, and master black belt. She combines statistical expertise with extensive knowledge of manufacturing platforms and analytical sciences in conjunction with business and regulatory acumen to achieve goals. She has functioned as both an in-house and external statistical consultant to drug substance and drug product teams from product development through commercial supply for spectrum of product platforms. She frequently speaks at industry forums and publishes on the practical incorporation of statistical methods for life cycle process validation. Of course, she's on the ISP team for this validation guidance. Keyur Doshi is a senior validation manager at Anika Therapeutics in Belford, uh, Massachusetts. He has over 15 years of experience in managing validation, metrology, and engineering programs in the biopharmaceutical and medical device industry. His experience includes validation of processes, equipment, single-use systems, utilities, computerized systems, clean room facilities, cleaning, labeling, packaging, and cold chain, shipping. He is currently on the ISP process validation committee as a part of the PQLI initiative. So indeed we are fortunate to have both these experts and their presentation will be for about 90 minutes which will be followed by Q&A sessions for about 15 to 30 minutes. Please ask your questions at the end of the presentation, listen to the complete presentation and then you can type your questions in the questions tab of the control panel. Ladies and gentlemen, with these few words, please welcome Tara to initiate this webinar. Over to you. Uh, thanks very much, Uday, for um, uh, uh, that nice introduction. And I think your webinar series that you talk about and the amount that you've been able to deliver is very, very impressive series. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. I'll, I'll preface it with, you know, we, we have 90 minutes. Uh, we have a lot of information here for you, which uh, so so I will I'll go through relatively quickly. But you of course have the recording, um, and you know you'll have the slides to review uh, to go back uh, because in some cases I'll go through maybe some graphics or some lists quite quickly, not in detail, but you'll have them there for your reference. Uh, so as usual, we'll start with the disclosure um, that, that the views, thoughts, and opinions in this presentation are solely mine and Kayors and not necessarily reflect the, our, our present or past employers, organization, company, group, or other in, a committee, <clears throat> other group or individual. So here are the topics that we'll walk through today. 
I'll start out um, talking about historical validation practices uh, and introduce uh, the FDA guidance on process validation. I'll hand it over at that point to Kay York, who will review some very, very relevant uh, FDA warning letters. We'll talk about FDA expectations, and then we'll get into some detail about the three stages of life cycle validation that's in the 2011 FDA guidance. I'll pass it back over to Kayor to um, talk about the EU guidelines for process validation uh, and how they compare to the FDA guidance. Um, and we'll he'll finish out with uh, a general section of implementation challenges, documents that you'll use, and deliverables for the stages. So let's talk about the start out with historical validation practice. So in the past, we would have one release sample per batch. You know, in the, in the idea of the old way of doing the, uh, validation, we have one release sample per batch. If that release sample passed, the batch passes. And if we could do that three times for three batches, it was a validation success. But there's some uncertainty with that practice, right? One release sample for three, uh, per batch what about the rest of the batch? How do you know the rest of the batch will meet acceptance criteria? And what about the next batch and the batch after that and so on? How can you be sure with such a small amount of sampling um, and confirmation of your process um, that you can assure ongoing product quality? Well, the FDA said, we're gonna think differently about this, about validation. We're going to define it as the collection and evaluation of data from the process design stage, notice the process design stage throughout production. So it's not that one off event of three batches and done. And it, you'll establish scientific evidence that a process is consistently, is capable of consistently delivering quality products. The EMA defines it similarly. It's documented evidence that the process operated within established parameters can perform effectively and reproducibly to produce a medical product meaning its predetermined specifications and quality attributes. Now the FDA thought of proposed in 2011 this uh, life cycle approach. Now this is a slide from an FDA presentation by Grace McNally who was one of the uh, authors of the 2011 guidance for process validation and here in this in this graphic you can see that there's three stages process design um, uh, i want to make sure you can see if i if i have a laser pointer uh, you can see process design you can see stage two process qualification which is divided into two separate stages and stage three. So you can see three stages across the life cycle, beginning with stage one, developing the process. You want to evaluate and confirm that, so you move into stage two. After you have confirmed your, your, that your process design and control strategy are good, you're ready to distribute. But you must continue to monitor that process and the quality more than you used to, the expectation is more than annual review, in the stage continued process verification. Now notice, you can move back to process design after process qualification. For instance, if you find that uh, there are still risks to the patient after your uh, process qualification stage, you may go back to process design and reevaluate. Even in continued process verification, you might may find situations where you need to go back to process design. That might be deliberate, that might be a tech transfer to a new site, and there may be some process design um, that you need to do for that new site, um, in which case you might have to go through process qualification again, or it may be unplanned um, that you have quality issues that require you going back to the process design stage. So later, you know, throughout this the, the the webinar, these are these are the three stages that we'll get into more detail. But this graphic introduces it um, and the concepts of lifecycle process validation. The key documents to keep in mind um, regarding this process lifecycle process validation are the are the FDA guidance 
from 2011. Now, what, what, what did the FDA say we're basing this on? It wasn't new stuff, right? It wasn't new stuff that's not new expectations because the expectations in the guidance are actually based on uh, 21 CFR 211, um, specific um, sections of that. Uh, they rely on the pharmaceutical CGMPs for the 21st century, a risk-based approach. And embedded within the process validation guidance are the concepts that are in ICH Q8, Q9, Q10, and Q11. So in the EMA process validation guidance, which was um, published in 2014 and 2016, also really relies and, and, and uh, specifically identifies reliance on the ICH guidances listed here. Uh, so both the FDA and the EMA say, we're, we're not doing new things, really. These things have been in place with variance codes, vari various codes of regulations, and also ICH guidances. And the EMA also um, uh, has related to process validation is uh, the Annex 15, which was uh, which was published in 2015. These two, KUR, as I mentioned, KUR will mention, we'll talk about these two um, toward the end of the presentation today. So in general, what does the FDA expect in general? Validation is a continuum across the product life cycle. It's not that one time event of three batches. Process understanding and appropriate controls is key We'll see that over and over again, talking about variability and understanding that variability that can come into your process and how will you control that variability. You'll see that in the next slide, actually. A quote from there, uh, from the FDA guidance. Quality risk management is foundational across the life cycle. The decisions that we make in each stage are risk-based decisions. And evidence-based decisions and statistical methods should be applied when applicable. This is the, the statistical methods uh, expectation is identified multiple times in the FDA guidance document. So anytime you see quotes um, in this presentation, that means it's a it's an excerpt from the FDA. Uh, 2011 guidance on process validation. Now this one I think is particularly useful to keep in mind. Manufacturers should understand the sources of variation, detect the presence and degree of variation, understand the impact of variation on the process and ultimately on product attributes, and control the variation in a manner commensurate with the risk it represents to the process and product. So this is that idea of um, under, you know, process understanding is key and the controls in place um, to manage that variation. Those are the key thing, the, the key expectations. If that's done well, process understanding and, and the relevant controls uh, for the variability that could enter your process, if that's done well, then the rest of the uh, the rest of the uh, of the expectations and the tasks that you must um, take will fall in place with this in, with this general concept in mind. Okay, I'm going to pass it over to um, going to pass it over to KUR now um, to talk about. FDA examples of FDA warning letters. Okay, you are here. The control is coming to you. Okay, you can share your screen. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, let me check it to. Okay. Let me minimize this. Okay, perfect. Can you see my screen again? Yes. All right. So, uh, 
we're going to look at some of the examples uh, of the FDA warning letters. Um, you will see a theme uh, from what Tara mentioned in the 2011 process validation guidance. Um, I specifically picked some of these up from the past two or three years. Uh, it's been 10 years now since the guidance has been out. So, so let us see uh, what are some of the observations, what are some of the warning letters regarding process validation. So this first example is from a warning letter uh, in January this year. Um, and the theme is that the PPQ lacked intra-batch variability and the whole PV life cycle was missing. So uh, I'll go through this very quickly, but uh, basically the firm failed to adequately validate the manufacturing process. These were tablets um, in this case. The issue was about homogeneity uh, during the blend analysis. Uh, and they said that during your PPQ, uh, you handle the, uh, the blend samples in a way that potentially masks the variability of the blend. So some of these key words, right? These keep on popping up uh, all the time. In the response, so this was probably a 483, and then in the response, uh, they said they'll perform concurrent validation uh, to collect sufficient data to evaluate product behavior. However, in the warning letter, the FDA said, your response is not providing sufficient data to show where variability is occurring. So this is the key that, that the variability is still missing uh, in their revalidation that they were going to perform. Uh, the FDA also said that concurrent validation should be rarely used. So that's the other thing as well that's mentioned. I think there's like a little paragraph in the process validation guidance about concurrent validation. Uh, mind you, in the previous validation guidance in 1987, there was talks about retrospective validation, concurrent validation. All of that is gone now. There's a little small paragraph on concurrent validation. So it should be rarely used and justified. Uh, and then finally, your manufacturing failures indicate you do not have adequate ongoing program for monitoring and process control. So this is nothing but the stage three that we are talking of. Um, and then there are issues in stage two in terms of the variability. Let's look at uh, the next example. This is from Jan 2020, once again, missing the process validation lifecycle approach. Your firm failed to validate the manufacturing processes. These are all OTC products. Um, and your response, you stated you will consult a firm to do qualify your equipment and also conduct process validation studies. But as you can see, your response is inadequate because you did not provide a detailed validation plan. Um, and the, in the plan, there was uh, what was missing was um, the variability from interbatch and intrabatch as well as uh, ensuring a continued state of control, which is once again stage three. So it's you'll see this theme coming up uh, in the next one as well, state of control throughout the product life cycle, which means the firm was trying to validate. So they were doing the, the confirmatory batches or the PPQ batches, stage two, but there was no stage three program. So that's, that's the, the theme. I'll move on to the next one. Um, missing PV life cycle again. This is from October 2019. I, I, I specifically picked up a handful of these uh, warning letters so that we get an idea on how this how gaps in the PV life cycle approach have been picked up by the FDA. So your firm did not properly follow uh, follow your PV protocol. Uh, which required quality attributes to be met for three consecutive batches. I think what happened was um, the three batches failed on a particular uh, attribute on the dissolution assay. Uh, a fourth batch was performed, uh, which failed as well. In fact, it, the FDA letter says the quality rejected all four PV batches. Yet a new interim protocol was created to justify commercial use for the alternate API. Um, and so uh, in the response in this in this warning letter, I think, and these are very important sentences that the FDA has written. Um, 
they're basically going on to explain what the process validation is. Um, so process validation evaluates the soundness of design and state of control. Uh, I think very key words over there, state of control. Uh, they go on to say about each significant stage, the manufacturing process. So that's the other part that the stage, uh, that the stages should be uh, clear and one should end and the other should start. And then finally, process qualification studies, the PPQs or the confirmatory batches, whatever you call it, they determine an initial state of control. And this is key over here. Uh, these are not uh, end all and be all by itself. These just provide an initial state of control has been established. And then finally, they go on to talk about ongoing uh, vigilant, uh, ongoing um, oversight of process performance and product quality is necessary for our product life cycle. So um, those are some of the observations. I'll go through the fourth one, but it's it's similar. Um, you did not validate your process used in manufactured drug product prior to distribution. Um, process validation evaluates soundness design. So the same sentences have come again. Um, and then uh, each uh, stage uh, has a meaning. Each significant stage of the process must be designed appropriately and a initial state of control is established by the PPQ studies. So with that, um, I will hand it over back to Tara to go on to the implementation of the three stages of the life cycle. Okay, so here I make you the presenter again, Tara. Okay, the control is with you now. You should see my screen at this point, huh? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, those were very, very relevant and interesting warning letters that Kaior shared. Um, there were there were certainly commonalities um, between each of those warning uh, in each of those warning letters regarding what what life cycle process validation really is. Um, you notice quite a lot about variability um, and understanding inter and intra batch variability. We'll talk about that in an upcoming slide. Um, so you can see really that the expectations are there of the things that we'll talk about from this point forward in our webinar. The expectations are that you will implement a life cycle approach to validation, not simply three batch, not simply what was done in the past. The expectations are, 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 um, are more robust now as far as do you understand the sources of variability in your process and have you put into place um, a good control strategy, which we'll talk about. So those were really, I think those warning letters gave us very clear understanding of the expectations of the FDA. Um, and what they're looking for in, in validation. So here are the three stages that we've, that we've mentioned uh, and, you're, and you may be familiar with. Um, stage one, stage two, and stage three, and the goals. So in stage one, the commercial process is defined based on knowledge gained through development and scale up activities. In stage two, the process design is evaluated and assessed to determine if the process is capable of reproducible commercial manufacture. And in stage three, we're, um, we're obtaining ongoing assurance that during routine protection that the process remains in a state of control. Notice, if you remember in a few of those warning letters, this, this, these words state of controls mentioned multiple times in multiple, in, in several of those letters. We can also think of, um, and we're collecting scientific evidence across the product life cycle. Um, we have a line of sight to the end. What will we be doing when we're in stage one? We have an idea of what we'll be doing in stage three, but we can also look backwards when we're in stage three. We understand what we're doing in stage three is based on the things we learned in stage one. We can also think of, um, 
what type of risk are we are we managing across the three stages? Remember, I said that quality risk management is foundational to the life cycle approach. So if we, we can also put in terms of, uh, in, in addition to the goals of each stage, we can also think about what risks we're mitigating in each of the stages. So in the beginning, in the new process, or even in a tech, uh, tech transfer, for instance, to a new site, we might be, we are mitigating the risk in stage one due to the lack of understanding and or control of relationships between the inputs and the outputs. So between the process parameters and the critical quality attributes, for instance. In stage two, we're mitigating the risk from sampling uncertainty. We don't measure every tablet, every vial, every tube, whatever our, our unit dosage is. We don't measure every one. So there's sampling uncertainty. We measure um, a small amount of a total population of a batch. We're, we're mitigating the risk due to scale differences. We, you know, if we in a, in, a, in a biologic product, let's say we've been using a small, small scale um, reactors and, and columns, uh, separation columns, and we have to assess what our what our scale differences are, and then normal operating variability too. Remember, we talk about reproducibility, ongoing reproducibility. What about the the effects due to different raw materials and operators and so on? And then finally, in stage three, the risk we're mitigating is uh, due to any change in the process measurement or behavior. We want to identify that change as soon as possible. So if we think about ultimately the line of sight all the way to this patient that's taking these capsules, what is the risk that we're, you know, what are what are we, what risk are we mitigating ultimately? We're mitigating that one of those capsules won't be what we won't have the quality that we expect or or we claim, right? And it that those capsules are all over the world. There are different strengths. They're in different packages and so on, right? So, but and this is a tall order. This is a big, this is a big ask that every one of those capsules, no matter where, when, how, um, has the quality that we expect. That's 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 a challenge, right? Because within our process, we have many sources of variability, right? And this this is getting very key into that expectation about understanding sources and controlling sources of variability. There, it's from equipment, it's from the environment, it's from the raw materials, it's from measurement, it's from the operators, all these sources of variability. And in addition to that, as uh, when we have a something like a unit dosage, when we have something like a capsule or a vial, we're not measuring every one of those, right? We're only we're taking a sample. So how do we how do we live with all this variability and sampling? But be able to say that, hey, there's no there's no risk to that patient. Every one of those capsules will be the product quality that we we intend and claim. How do we do that? Well, it's a combination of science and statistics. It's a very powerful combination across the life cycle that we apply, and and we'll talk in some detail about how we make that combination. Um, so let's talk about, since we're saying risk, ultimately we're mitigating the risk to this patient, but we said what we apply quality risk management principles across the product life cycle to ultimately mitigate this final risk. So let's talk about, th these are um, uh, two primary principles of quality risk management uh, in, in ICHQ9. The evaluation of the risk to product quality should be based on scientific knowledge and ultimately linked to the product to the protection of the patient, and the level of effort, formality, and documentation of the quality risk management process should be commensurate with the level of risk. And we'll be applying we'll be applying both of these principles over and over again throughout the life cycle in process design, during process qualification, and continued process verification. We apply these two principles. What is the risk to the patient? And how what and how serious is that risk? This is a it, this is the quality risk management process that you'll find in ICHQ9. Of course, I'm not going to go into detail for each one of these steps in this presentation. I'll just uh, suffice it to say that each one of these risk assessment, risk control, and risk review again will be used in an ongoing manner across life cycle process validation. In, in process design, we're identifying parameters that we don't understand. 
we're figuring out how to control them. And then we're, we're, we're reviewing them um, actually as in an ongoing future way, even in, in, from in PPQ and then in, in CPV. During, during CPV, for instance, we may find that we have a process that seems to have changed. We will assess that risk. We will decide how we'll control that risk and we'll determine how we'll review our mitigation strategy for that risk. So this, these are applied over and over again, foundational to um, the life cycle process validation. So let's move into talking about um, in a little bit more detail what we're doing in each one of the in each one of the um, stages. In stage one, and and, and we'll, we'll 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 you we'll we'll ground ourselves with we're mitigating risk in stage one due to the lack of process understanding and or control of the relationships between process inputs and parameters and the product attributes that we want to maintain within some range that we have determined is good for the patient. So what are the expectations of process design? This, these are identified in, in a document that was published relatively recently since the 2011 guidance. This was published in 2016. Uh, manual policies and procedures applying ICHQA, Q9, and Q10 principles to CMC review. So what, do, what does the FDA expect? They expect that you'll define the quality target product profile. The, that, that's identified in ICHQA, as is the potential critical quality attributes of the drug product. Uh, will determine the CQAs of the drug substance. We'll select an appropriate manufacturing process and define and justify a control strategy. So these are the these are the expectations for the process design stage. Now let's talk a little bit more in detail about the control strategy. The control strategy is the key to commercial manufacturing and ensures all CQAs are within acceptable limits, therefore meeting the requirements of the QTPP, quality target product profile, because we we start with a quality target product profile. We identify the CQAs that, will that we will measure to ensure we meet the quality target product profile. The control strategy is key. What really is the, the level of success of the control strategy depends, and that's the product and process, depends on the level of process understanding. Again, foundational is this process understanding that starts in process design and is a tr true expectation you can see in the warning letters um, that Kayor reviewed. You could see that process understanding, that process understanding was key. The control strategy defines how to manufacture the product, control the input and output of all process steps, control the execution of the process, control the environment, and confirm the finished product. The output of the design stage defines the activities for process validation stages two and three. Once we have developed this control strategy, what we're doing in stage two really is confirming it. We're demonstrating in stage two that the control strategy that we have developed is indeed an appropriate one. So the question is, how do we establish the control strategy? What are the steps that we need to take to develop this control strategy. We're saying that it's key. We're saying how important it is. What are the steps that we'll take? Well, we'll be applying quality by design principles, right? These quality by design principles defined in ICHQ8, quality by design is defined as a systematic approach to development that begins with predefined objectives and emphasizes product and process understanding and process control based on sound science and quality risk management. So what does that systematic approach look like? We can see here, we always start with the patient. We start with the patient needs. And that's the, the quality target product profile. We, we, we identify what that patient needs. We develop critical quality attributes that will measure to meet that quality target product profile. We'll, de we'll, we'll uh, develop our product and process. 
From that, we'll say, what are the critical process parameters and critical material attributes within this product, within this process that we will need to control? We have to decide where, where, where will we control these CPPs and CMAs? What are the ranges in the design or the design space that we will develop to control them? That becomes our control strategy. Our, con our control strategy, those ranges plus many, many other things become part of our control strategy. Uh, and then once that's in place, we, um, we have ongoing manufacture and opportunities for continual improvements. So it's very, it, if we follow this systematic approach, we will develop the necessary understanding and the necessary controls um, that are expected. And, and will enable, that are, that are expected and also will enable us uh, to, to deliver ongoing quality to our patient. So, so we'll meet the FDA expectations for, for uh, process design. We will deliver um, quality product to our patients, um, which obviously has, uh, is, is, our, our, is our business goal. So just one slide on the idea of uh, some statistics you can use, powerful statistics that you can use within stage one. So if we start with our, um, uh, our patient, as we said, um, we have a patient here and somewhere down the road, we have assurance of quality and there's a big gap in the beginning. Uh, we, we need to fill this gap with knowledge. And we start with our quality target product profile translated into CQAs. Then we do a risk assessment and we say, hey, we have a process. What unit operations in our process do we have, still need to understand the relationship between process parameters and material attributes and ultimately these CQAs? What are the unit operations we need to evaluate? And what are the, again, another risk assessment, what are the process and parameters within a unit operation? Okay, so we still have a big knowledge gap here. We have a knowledge gap and we have a control gap here. How do we fill this gap? Well, we can use very efficiently design of experiments and, that's, uh, and develop our design space. And our design space, again from ICHQ8, is the multi-dimensional combination and interaction of input variables and process parameters that have been demonstrated to provide assurance of quality. Once we've done that, we can combine this um, uh, process and operation knowledge with statistics to develop our control strategy. That's how we fill that gap. Ultimately, we start with the patient, we need to assure quality. When we work backwards, we need that control strategy to do that. Well, how do we get to the control strategy? Through this very scientific and statistically based approach to determine what is it about these process parameters and material attributes will ultimately affect those CQAs and ultimately affect our ability to, to, to um, meet the quality target product profile. The experimental design is the most efficient. So indeed, um, the, the uh, FDA does mention the term multivariate uh, in a multivariate approach in the FDA guidance. If you want a multivariate approach, the most efficient way from a business standpoint is to use statistically designed experiments. You'll have less, uh, you'll, you'll maximize the information you get from each run. So let's move into stage two. What are we mitigating in stage two? We're mitigating the risk from sampling uncertainty, scale differences, and normal operating variability. So some fundamentals of, remember too, um, uh, I, I'm, well actually I didn't, I don't know that I mentioned. Stage two is, div, is divided into two stages, 2.1 and 2.2 it's called. 2.1 is facility and equipment uh, qualification and stage two, Point two is process performance qualification or those batches that we're planning to make as part of process, the overall process qualification. So let's first start talking about stage 2.1, which is around the facilities, uh, systems, utilities, and equipment. So it's a regulatory expectation that those, those 
facilities, systems, utilities, and equipment are designed, constructed, and qualified to be suited for the intended purpose. Commissioning is a term used to say we're bringing new facilities into first use. Qualification is, a, is different. It's the requirement to demonstrate that the equipment work as intended. They don't just, uh, we haven't just put them into place. We have to design tests um, uh, to, to ensure they work as intended. The quality unit is the, are, uh, are, is, the, is the function that decides whether systems are suited both for the intended purpose, based on this testing and documentation that have been deemed critical to product quality. These terms, the terms uh, commissioning and qualification differ in that the qualification process is oversight by the quality unit, focusing on the system risks to product quality, that idea of suitable for intended purpose to, develop, to deliver quality product. So verification is a term that sometimes is used within industry sectors or organizations to cover all the uh, qualification steps, um, DQ, IQ, OQ, and PQ. And I'll talk about verification in an upcoming slide. So ISPE has a commissioning and qualification guide relatively recently published that you might be interested in obtaining. And this map um, is from page 11 of that um, of that guide. So we can see here inputs to the commissioning and qualification process. We can see that we have a product risk assessment and the control strategy. Uh, we have CQA, CPPs, and then we have some um, regulatory, operational, and health safety in, in, uh, requirements. Then we have our, our, our user specifications. We define our requirements in, in this area here user specification, system classification, and risk assessment. And then we have planning, and we have uh, DR and DQ here in our design and specify. Now here is the verification stage, right? The verification stage here, this testing and documentation, documentation is key um, because this is where we're showing that the uh, facilities and equipment are uh, intended, are, are performing as, in, as they're intended. So if we take a look, let's take a look at this particular um, for the list of crit critical aspects. And those critical aspects. Um, are related to the CQAs and CPPs, this would be approved by the quality unit. The verification plan is approved by the quality unit. But in the middle, all the verification testing uh, to confirm the critical aspects and meet the acceptance criteria, that's done um, by subject matter experts following good engineering practices. They're across the whole, they're across the whole, uh, all the activities, um, but you can see in the center here, the quality unit does not need to be involved in this verification testing stage. But at the end of that, that testing for acceptance and release, uh, the quality unit again is um, involved and approves that, uh, that verification. Now, how do we get to that's that that's a very quick overview of of stage 2.1 how do we get to stage 2.2 or the process performance qualification stage you can see here that um, we start with a, the initial development and the initial specifications do iqoq um, again these terms iqoq you know can also be thought of in terms of verification on the on in the last slide um, in the end, Kate, there is a difference in in uh, terminology between the uh, EMA and and the FDA in terms of the uses of, of these terms, specific uses of these terms. But um, Kate, you're able to talk about that a, a bit at the end. Um, but it just suffices to say that here we're doing that that verification. 
Um, we have our demo runs, our, our process qualification demo runs. Uh, we do a risk assessment. We update our control strategy as necessary. We're assessing our variability. We assess our uh, strategy, uh, PPQ strategy, and our readiness for PPQ. We've got our PPQ protocol. That protocol will include a sampling plan and the number of batches. We're incorporating regulatory requirements, and then we eventually execute that PPQ, um, some, some repeat number of batches, and move on to CPV and OPV. So that's our typical roadmap to get to PPQ. And uh, for a legacy product, the starting point, it won't necessarily start here at initial de development. It may, it may start in just some demo runs because the, uh, there's been no changes to equipment and so on, depending on the process change that is requiring PPQ. So what's the goal of PPQ? Um, what's the goal of those repeat batches that we will manufacture at commercial scale prior to going into the marketing and commercial stage. A, success, a successful PPQ will confirm the process design and demonstrate that the commercial manufacturing process performs as expected. Seems pretty straightforward, but key words here are confirm and demonstrate. We need to gather the evidence to do that. And before any batch from the process is commercially distributed for use by consumers, a manufacturer should have gained a high degree of assurance in the performance of the manufacturing process. Information and data should demonstrate that the commercial manufacturing process is capable of consistently producing acceptable quality products within commercial manufacturing conditions. If you think back on some of those warning letters, okay, you're shared with us today, you can see where they identified that there was a lack of information and data. They weren't understand, they weren't able to confirm the process design demonstrated the commercial manufacturing process performs as expected because they didn't have the, the data to show that they understood the um, variability within and between batches, inter and intra. Um, uh, they they and and then moving forward they didn't have a, a plan for um, ongoing demonstration the data they needed for ongoing demonstration in uh, that you'll see in continued process verification the third stage so we we mentioned this idea about within and between batches and this is a this is an excerpt a quote from the FDA guidance the number of samples should be adequate to provide sufficient statistical confidence of quality both within and between batches. The approach of the, again, these are all, all quotes from the FDA guidance. The approach to PPQ should be based on sound science and the manufacturer's overall level of product and process understanding and demonstrable control. You can use the cumulative data from all relevant studies to establish the manufacturing conditions in PPQ. And then finally, we have here, we strongly recommend firms employ objective measures such as statistical metrics wherever feasible and meaningful to achieve adequate assurance. So those are some relevant key excerpts from the guidance to, to, to identify that what type of sampling you need to do in order to be able to demonstrate what is expected at the end of PPQ. So what what are what are what do we mean by intra and inter batch sampling? So intra batch is multiple samples taken within a single batch used to assess control and capability of that batch. Prior knowledge from homogeneity evaluation can be leveraged. If you have something like a um, if you're manufacturing an API and it's a and it's an aqueous solution, you may not need to take multiple samples within that batch. You may have shown earlier in the process design stage that you have homogeneity within that batch, and that may be adequate. You can leverage that information. You can evaluate intra-batch variability using graph statistical intervals, variance components, um, and control charts if there's a time element in a large sample size, and it's typically greater than commercial sampling. So here are some pictures of intra-batch variability. Here we have a
situation where we, we have a singular batch. We think there might be differences in the way the operators perform multiple. This is a of a, a gauge R and R type study that you actually might do for analytical methods. This is a an intra batch sampling design. Um, this might be the picture of a of a lyophilization cabinet where you have multiple shelves within that cabinet, and within each shelf you have multiple locations. So you have identified that what sources of what are sources of variability from your process understanding, your scientific knowledge. Remember, I say we combine science and statistics from your scientific knowledge about that lyophilization cabinet. What can affect moisture in a vial, let's say, of product? Um, and it may be shelf to shelf variability, and it might be the corners of the shelf compared to the middle of the shelf and so on. So you, you determine that you'll sample accordingly based on that scientific understanding of risk of the, the lyophilization being different across shelves and across locations in the shelf. You see how everything comes back to where are where is our risk? Our risk is that we might have too high of a moisture in a vial. What could cause too high of moisture in the vial? Not proper lyophilization. What, where are our sources of variability within that lyophilization process? Well, we have different shells and we might have cold spots, really cold spots or warm spots within that lyophilization cabinet. So you can see how we, how we drill down. Ultimately, from, from starting at a risk assessment all the way down to a sampling plan to mitigate that risk. And we apply statistics to show, are there differences between those? We, we can apply statistics to show, are there differences between the shelves? I mentioned something called variance components. We can apply a very, very lovely and powerful analysis called variance components that says, how much variability comes between from the shelves, how much comes from the location in the shelves, how much comes from batch to batch, to show that we understand that intra and inter batch variability that was specifically noted, if you remember, in those warning letters. And finally, another simple example is we may test the beginning, middle, and end of a batch, or we may have 20, 20 time locations across a batch. We may have beginning, middle, and end. We may have top, middle, and bottom. The point here is you identify those the sampling plan that addresses potential sources of variability. You gather data so that you can understand that variability within a batch. Now, what about interbatch? Interbatch, we mean that the results of multiple map batches are compared to assess reproducibility. We can evaluate those. We can evaluate. Uh, that these are data using graphs again variance components maybe analysis of variance and keep in mind that ppq data can be too too limited to make a strong inter-batch assessment we may only have three four or five batches evaluation will continue in stage 3a that's the in, the first stage in stage three um, and that's that's something different than the past right in the past when we once we validated something with three batches we didn't look at inter-batch variability until annual review. Now the expectation is, no, don't wait until annual review, particularly with a new product. Start, pay more attention to that inter-batch between batch variability. Um, pay much more attention to that than you did in the past. And you noticed, again, going back to those warning letters that KU are, that KU are shared. There were multiple times they mentioned, you don't have a plan for ongoing monitoring. They were talking about that stage three. Okay, so sampling for PPQ is designed to obtain the required evidence that the process is in control. By that, we mean it's consistent, stable, and predictable. It's reproducible. It's robust to typical sources of variability like raw materials or operating shift. It's capable, meaning it's able to meet specification. Our sampling must be large enough to make a desired statistical capability statement. If we want to make, and I'm going to share with you um, statements um, in just potential statements in just a minute. We, but taking three samples, four samples per batch may not be enough. We can statistically um, justify 
our sampling plan for capability. We want to reflect the potential sources of variability to show that the effect of any is expected and acceptable. You know, we may see variability within that lyophilization cabinet, but it may be expected from a scientific perspective. What we're trying to show is, hey, it's no more than we expect, and we're or we're not surprised about the variability that we have observed based on our scientific understanding of that process. We can incorporate process knowledge gained through process development, similar product and process experience, right? We can, we can leverage platform knowledge that we may have, and we can incorporate statistical methods and metrics in order to design our sampling plan and analyze it. So here's when I'm talking about a capability statement. Uh, be large enough to make a desired statistical capability statement. Remember, at the we we don't measure every <clears throat> every unit dose. So how do we make a statement <clears throat> about if we have a million tablets? How do we make a statement? Well, we can use a statistical capability statement such as this one. We may come up with a statement that says we are 95% confident that the mean assay will be between 97 and a half and 100.2. We may use a tolerance interval to say we are 95% confident that 95% of the potency values in this batch will be between some, this, these are computed, 97 and 102, computed, computed from data. Or we have a, we may be using ASTM 2709 or 2810 and make a statement about the likelihood of samples passing the uniformity dosage unit claim. And then we might have something where we're where we are measuring the likelihood of a defect, like a label defect on a bottle. So you notice in each one of these, um, what we're what we're what we're trying to do, the purpose of each one of these statements is to make a statement about a population from just a set of samples, right? It's not just we don't notice this is different. We don't just have a release sample and say the batch passed. Of course, we have to do that. We have release testing and it must patch, pass. But in order to show, before we move into commercial supply, that if we went ahead and tested additional samples that they would likely pass, we need to go a bit further with one of these types of statistical statements. And we can, at the time of PPQ, typically we're not going to be using things like uh, CPK or PPK because we just don't have enough data. Um, so that's why we rely on these, uh, it's, we rely on these uh, capability type statements. So what's in, a, what's in the process validation protocol for PPQ? Um, I'm not going to go into any, uh, obviously, I'm not going to go into detail here. This is really a list for you, for your reference to, to um, think about what would be in that PPQ protocol. So let's move into, let's move into stage three, um, where we're trying to mitigate the risk due to the change in process or measurement behavior. That's the risk that we're trying to mitigate in stage three. In the guidance, you'll find this quote, in continued process verification stage, we're, we're obtaining continual assurance that the process remains in a state of control, which is the validated state, the state that we demonstrated back in PPQ, during commercial manufacture, a system or systems for detecting unplanned departures from the process as designed is essential to accomplish this goal. And that, if you remember back to back to KUR's FDA warning letters, um, a, a, a couple of them included citations from the FDA saying, you did not have this system. You did not have an ongoing monitoring plan in place. They were missing the system. This, this, this plan should guard against overreaction to individual events, as well as failure to detect unintended process variability. If properly carried out, these efforts can identify variability in the process and or signal potential process improvements. 
So the idea of continued process verification is let's not wait until something goes out of specification. Let's not wait until annual review to review how our process is behaving. We should have an on, we, we should be, um, uh, we, want, we want to detect unintended process variability and add that to our process understanding. Uh, we want to detect that um, sooner rather than later. We don't want to wait until we're in a crisis because something is out of specification. We want to alert ourselves to unintended process variability and mitigate that. So what, what are some of the design components of a CPV program? Uh, well, there's the, the what, the when, the who, and the how, right? We have to, for a CPV program, we need to have all of, of, of those questions answered. The what, what attributes and parameters, how often will we measure this, and how often will we report it? We don't, we don't necessarily, um, need to report, write a report every time we look at the data. We should be actually have a process in place, a business process in place to look at that data frequently by an SME, right? The who, the statistician may help design the types of charts that we have, but, um, or the use of those charts, but it's the process SME who will be evaluating those charts. And then how will we do it? Uh, what charts will we use? And how will we evaluate this state of control? I have an upcoming slide about that in specifically. But let's, but in each one of these, notice each one, uh, the, the what, the when, and the how, we're applying risk, uh, we're, we're assessing risk uh, in order to make those decisions. We assess risk for the, what should, what should we include? How often and how do we how do we measure and and how do we monitor and then in an ongoing way we'll apply risk we'll assess risks when we do see changes in our process in identified in those charts. So let's talk a little bit about the what the what what attributes and parameters how do we apply a risk based approach to those attributes and parameters? Do we, do we include absolutely every parameter we have? Every critical process parameter, or will we trend it? That might be unnecessary based on risk. For instance, we might set, we might consider our rela the relationship to the product quality. We might consider the control strategy. Well, by com consider relationship to the product quality, we might say a, a, a specific parameter that we have in place has a very, very strong relationship to one of our very important CQAs that might say we need to monitor it. On the flip side, we might say um, a certain parameter really isn't critical um, to product quality. We might not monitor that one. We might consider is the variability controlled within a range to have neglig negligible effect on product quality and or patient risk, ultimately patient risk. We might have identified a parameter to be critical. We might identify that a mix rate is critical, but we may have in stage one, in the design stage, we may have, we may have, uh, identified that we want to, because it's so important, we control that mix rate in a very tight range. And if it goes outside of that range, we have an alert and, and, and an operator takes action immediately. If that's the case, we've already mitigated the risk in using our control strategy. We've already mitigated the risk by controlling that mix rate, in which case, and, and, it, and it's essentially flat. Mix rate is 50, 50, 50, 50, 51, 50, 49, 50. It's essentially flat. At that point, we don't need to necessarily put that into our CPV monitoring program. However, we do need at some point to document why we're not. We need to document our, our process. We need to document our risk assessment process of the critical process parameters and why we choose to monitor them 
and why we may not choose to monitor them. We can't just not monitor them. If it's critical, we have to say, look, the reason why we're not monitoring them is the risk is already mitigated with our control strategy. Is it already monitored and controlled within a separate system? So if we have a if we have a tablet weight, for instance, uh, monitored in a in a check weigher type system, then we don't need to separately monitor that in our CPV program. We're already monitoring it and controlling it. Again, ultimately mitigating the risk that that tablet weight goes without that goes outside of range. It's already mitigated in another system. We don't need to be redundant. Again, ultimately, what are our risks? How are we how are they mitigated? And then at some point in your CPV program, you document how you made those decisions. IPCs have special characteristics. If you're if you're deliberately tweaking something to keep it in range, you have uh, specifications here, but you have alert limits here, um, and you and you deliberately make adjustments to stay within those alert limits. Um, you may or may not choose to include that, and if you do statistics on that, you must be very careful because it's a, it's not a, it's not a random variable; it's a controlled variable. And avoid meaningless charts. If something, as I mentioned, like that mixed rate, if it's completely flat, um, if a defect rate is always zero, 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 you, you, you're not, you, you know, if something's essentially constant, you don't need to include it as a chart. You may include a comment about it that. Uh, there were no there were no defect no defect counts above zero. Let's say you have an AQL plan or something like that. Let's talk about the when. How do you assess the risk for for the when part of the CPV program? How often do you review? How often do you report? Um, again, that's a risk based decision. It depends on product volume. It depends on process understanding. It depends on capability of that process. Now, early on in a process, you might not know the capability. How far are you from specification? How far does the variability observed, where does it fall within the specification limits? You don't know that in the beginning of a new product. So, you might frequently at that point evaluate and review your process performance. Um, later on, if you have a legacy product, for instance, that has high capability of meeting specification, you would, you would review and report on that particular product less frequently than that new product. Again, ultimately, one has higher risk than the other. Why? Ultimately, because of process, the amount of process understanding that you have, and the process variability that you expect and where that falls within uh, specifications and ultimately patient need. Unless the volume is quite small and capability is quite high, it's typically more than annually. This is an expectation um, by the FDA and, and also um, now the, the European, the EMA, and the European um, agencies that you're reviewing process performance more often than annually, um, unless again the volume is quite small. Uh, you know the the idea of, of, of a very good CPV program is one where you look at the data often enough that you identify a process change before it becomes a problem. That this doesn't just make sense from a compliance standpoint. This makes sense from a business standpoint. It doesn't cost a lot of effort if the program is set up smartly and efficiently. It's not a lot of effort for someone to take a look at data. Don't turn it into some monstrous program with all kinds of documentation and all kinds of approval signatures and routing. We want to look at that data as frequently as we can because the longer we wait, to look at data, let's say we look at data every, let's say we have a high volume product and we look at data every six months. Well, we've made 100 batches in those six months and there was a change back at batch 20. Mm, well, to identify the root cause for that maybe is going to be much more difficult six months later than, or four, you know, whatever it was, four months after the change occurred compared to if it was done sooner. 
So it's a balance, of course, between resources it takes to monitor and the risk um, that we may have if there's been a process change. But the expectation is that's a this when is typically not annually and it's based on risk. Now let's talk about the difference between stage three, <coughs> stage three A and stage three B. Stage three A and stage three B are not terms you will find specifically identified in the 2011 FDA guidance document. It is, they are terms that have been developed by industry and they're well recognized across the pharmaceutical industry. In stage three A, we're developing the baseline performance for legacy products, this baseline performance will collect historical data. For new products, we may include enhanced sampling or heightened testing. I'll have a, a slide upcoming about that. Stage 3A planning um, begins in stage one. The final plan is based on PPQ performance. Often more frequent monitoring than stage 3B in stage 3A. So it, even if we're not taking additional sampling in stage 3B, 3A, Quite often, as we're developing this baseline performance, we may be evaluating more often. We may be evaluating every campaign. We may be evaluating every six batches. We may be evaluating every month, whereas later, as we gain more information, that, that monitoring frequency will be decreased. Stage 3B is that routine monitoring after we've got the baseline assessment. So, in the guidance document, we have this uh, excerpt. We recommend continued monitoring and sampling of process parameters and quality attributes at the level established during PPQ until sufficient data are, gener are available to generate significant variability estimates. They're saying you can't just go to release testing. If you have multiple intra-batch samples to understand intra-batch variability during PPQ, you can't just immediately go to release testing when you go into stage three. You have to show that there's that the risk is such that that would be okay. When strong statements of control reproducibility and capability, remember those are the, those are the evidence that we were looking for at the end of PPQ, when they cannot be made and some residual risk remains following PPQ, enhanced sampling is likely warranted. That means you may still continue to do beginning, middle and end samples. You may continue to do um, multiple samples um, in that lyophilization cabinet, for instance, if there's still residual risk. If there's variability that isn't, is okay with little risk to the patient, so you believe you can go into commercial supply. However, it may be a little different than what you expected from a scientific perspective or from your historical evaluation from the process design stage. You need a protocol to define the sampling and evaluation for this enhanced sampling. It depends on the duration and the plan itself depends on the residual knowledge gap. Uh, and you'll need to define the decisions and in interim final reporting plans um, for that sampling. Justifications to reduce testing to routine release levels must be provided. That's going back to this up here. We recommend continued monitoring until sufficient data is, av is available. It's saying that if you're not going to continue enhanced sampling like you had in PPQ, you need to justify otherwise, either right after PPQ, because things look very, very much as expected, process is highly capable based on your statistical evaluation, um, or it could be after, um, you're in you're in stage 3a and now you want to go to routine levels routine testing levels so these are just three examples i'll go through quite quickly um, in this case um, we have uh, a, this is a, a moisture example with multiple locations and shelves in a lyophilization cabinet here's our specification this is this is this is uh uh after uh data after PPQ. And we can see that we have we have differences. Sometimes sometimes uh, it's location. Uh, here we have location three and four that are the highest. Sometimes it's location uh, one that's the highest. Um, it doesn't appear to be anything. Uh, shelf number five definitely tends to be higher than any of the other shelves. Here's a, if, 
if we're if this sort of variability is not what we expected from a scientific standpoint, here's an example where we may decide to go into um, if this was our PPQ results. Th here's an example where we may decide to continue to monitor um, our shelves to make sure our intra-batch variability is acceptable. One release sample may not be enough because we're relatively close to that specification. Now, what we may do, we may put in place something where we realize after PPQ what's causing this, put an action in place, move into stage 3A and confirm that our actions address that. Here's an example. This is a control chart um, uh, across uh, three batches. And we can see toward the end of each batch, and these are multiple low, multiple samples across each batch for content uniformity. And we can see in each batch we have a, a drop toward the end. This is something we may uh, say, let's take a look and see why we think this is happening before we move into commercial supply and continue to take examples. This, on the other hand, this assay, we can see there's bottom, middle, and top of a tank for our assay. And we can see here, we had multiple samples per location um, that allows us to assess the, the sampling and analytical variability contribution, but we can see we're well within specification. And this is one where we don't need enhanced sampling because the risk is so minimal. Our process is behaving in control, capable and reproducible, and we could justify going to release sampling here. Let's talk very quickly about interpreting signals during CPV. This goes into the how. How will we, how will we uh, evaluate our process? This is a control chart, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And we see here these red dots. And the red dots are identifications from a statistical standpoint of behavior that's not expected by chance alone. But we can't interpret them as if the process is out of control. Because uh, as you would in a typical SPC textbook type application, because there's this assumption of independence and identically distributed, which of course I won't get into here, but we fail, we fail it. We fail an underlying assumption of classical SPC. Our common sources of variability are not used randomly. And we'll, tip, we'll see these sort of little subpopulations over and over again. They are not indications of um, that the process is out of control. Like you might read in a textbook, oh, the process is out of control. The process is out of control. No, it's because we fail this, this very important assumption. We can't say the process is, if we see statistical signals, we can't say the process is um, out of control. Um, because it's not necessarily. We should expect signals, in fact. Um, and those signals, I call these signals or Nelson rule violations. Um, there's multiple names for them. Kayor will talk about, mention them again in his section. We need a business process to evaluate them from in a risk-based way. And also don't rely just on these signals to notice that there's been a change in your process. Your eyes can actually identify a change sooner than the signals. I can't go into detail here, of course, um, but this is a this is something that the this uh, this interpretation of signals is something that the industry has has evolved as far as their approach to these, and now they are they have come to recognize, as have the agencies, that red dots, these statistical signals on a chart, are not necessarily indication of a lack of control. So. Um, the, we, we leverage a capability index um, to manage risk. It's the voice of the customer compared to the voice of the process. It's a metric to assess ability of the process to deliver what the patient or consumer requires. So we have, we have the patient range between the specifications and the process spread, spread. And this metric here accounts for non-centering of that picture here. The point I'm making here, I don't go into detail about this computation. The point here is, is process capability is something, is a metric that's used by, by every, every manufacturer that I, that I work with. Um, and they use it largely 
to for resource prioritization and risk-based responses to performance changes. Remember I said we have a risk assessment of if we see a performance change, we have to say, ooh, should we should we be worried about that? You know, if we see a slight shift in our control chart, should we be worried about that or not? That's a risk assessment. And this process capability metric is very useful to help us to determine should we should we get a whole team together because this is a real problem or you no know, let's let's not worry about this we've seen this type of shift before and our process capability is quite high based on our ppk okay with that i am going to stop sharing my screen i'm going to send it back over to um KUR to talk about the eu guidelines okay so KU here i'm making you the presenter and the control comes to you. Sounds good. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Let me just go oh. to the, yeah. Yeah, okay, fine. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about the similarities and the differences in the EU guidelines for life cycle process validation versus that of the FDA. Um, so there's an EMA guidance, uh, you know, this was revised in 2016 uh, on process validation. Uh, one of the, the, the distinct feature is it's very dossier focused. It says the approach you take uh, or you're going to take or you have taken should be documented in the dossier during submission. Um, we didn't see that kind of sort of specific requirements with the FDA guidance. Um, it is still science and risk-based, so uh, all the stuff that we've talked about, that Tara has talked about in the session, is still uh, in the EMA guidance. The reliance on critical quality attributes, the reliance on CPPs and risk assessments is still uh, in the EMA guidance. Um, the funny part about the EMA guidance, if, if you will, if I can use the word funny, is some of the naming convention is, is, is slightly different. But uh, make no mistake, uh, the, the approach is the same, the stages are the same, some of them are called something different. Uh, there are some differences which, which I'm going to talk about, but uh, stage one is called pharmaceutical development. We have process design and the FDA guidance. Stage two is called process validation. Now, mind you, the FDA guidance, we said the entire thing is called process validation, stage one to stage three. Stage two, where the FDA was called PPQ. Here, that's slightly different. Uh, and stage three is called ongoing process verification. Now, if all this, this is new to you guys, don't scratch your head. This is, it is what it is, right? So we had stage three as CPV, uh, continued process verification over there. Here you'll see ongoing process verification. Uh, there are three approaches mentioned in the EMA guidance. I, this I, I found in, in my own personal experience uh, uh, doing process validation over the many years, I found this to be really helpful in the EMA guidance. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about those three different approaches in the next slide. There's also a slight difference where the EMA guidance talks about standard and non-standard processes. Uh, and there is, there is a lot of uh, pointers, a lot of uh, uh, discussion in, in, in the guidance about what is standard and what is non-standard uh, and then how you can apply these to your own processes. So having said that, I'm going to go to the next slide. EMA part is consists of two main documents, if you will, the EMA guidance and process validation and Annex 15. Annex 15 was just uh, based on the previous PICS and uh, 15, um, but uh, now it is UDRELX uh, EU GMP Annex 15. Uh, the three approaches, this, this, this is, is, is a slight difference. This is a difference from the FDA uh, terminology and FDA approach, if you will. Um, you can do three batches. In fact, in my time in, back in 2014, 2015, when I was doing process validation, we did three batches and we submitted that to EMA. Um, and I'm in fact looking at the EMA report uh, after approval it says that the firm has followed a traditional approach. So that's a pretty legitimate um, uh, approach, if you will, of those three batches. Uh, and so that's, that's one of the approach. The second approach you could do is continuous process verification. Now, 
mind you, the word continuous. So, um, you know, these terminologies, you want to be a little bit careful, especially if you're, if you're designing a program based on uh, a, a submission to FDA and submission to EMA. Uh, continuous process verification is an approach where you are ditching the three batches approach, the standard three batches approach, and you're moving on to uh, the CQA and the CPP and all of those. Uh, so slightly different. Um, and then you have the hybrid approach, which is a mix of the two. Uh, this is the approach we took. However, in the EMA report, I saw that they said we've taken a traditional approach. Um, and some of it may be in what we submitted in the dossier, where we told them that we're going to take a traditional approach. Uh, so those that's a slightly different thing. You won't find this word traditional uh, and three batches in the FDA guidance. Uh, the EMA Annex 15, the, uh, the Utrilex Annex 15, also talks about transport qualification, packaging, utilities qualification, test methods, and cleaning. So it's a little bit more elaborate than the FDA guidance. The FDA guidance is specific to process validation. So once again, so similarities, as I said, the, the fundamentals of both are the same. There are some details. They both are based on the ICH approaches on QRM, uh, incorporating CQAs and CPPs, uh, and they require the link between product and process development to commercial scale manufacturing. Um, so, so those are the similarities. They require verification slash qualification during the life cycle. Uh, the differences, as I mentioned, are the wordings. So the ongoing, um, Process verification is stage three in EMA. It is equivalent to continued process verification stage three in FDA. Uh, and then the standard non-standard definition, this, this is not in the FDA at all. So this you will find in this EMA guidance. Uh, if, you're, if you're filing to EMA, uh, then you probably want to read this carefully. Uh, there are some pointers as to how do you come across with that determination. Uh, but, um, you know, like for example, biologics, they said the, the complexity in the process in itself, it becomes a non-standard process. And so the standard non-standard allows you to take the traditional approach or the hybrid approach and as you go. Uh, and then the FDA's uh, more deliberate use of statistics and understanding variability. Uh, it's not that the EMA guidance isn't based on that uh, uh, kind of an approach, but um, you know, the FDA has been very uh, deliberate and explicit on the use of statistics and variability. Some of that variability, intra-batch, inter-batch is what I talked about, if you remember, earlier on. Um, uh, I, I just did a check the other day, right? So FDA's guidance has like 15 times it's mentioned statistics, use statistics, use a statistical approach, you know. Uh, EMA probably had like mentioned that a couple of times. Um, so FDA was pretty deliberate on that. Uh, there are some differences on when you would have to present your PV data uh, and in terms of approval and so on and so forth between the two jurisdictions. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, EU GMP Annex 15 uh, talks about other uh, aspects of validation as well. Uh, this is just a visual uh, indication of what I just talked about. I'm not going to go through it again, but, but you will see the differences continued PV versus ongoing PV um, and, and, and the traditional approach uh, which you won't find mention over here anywhere. Um, I'm going to move on. So this last segment is implementation challenges, documents, and deliverables. So in a few minutes, I'm going to just go through my own experience uh, of uh, taking um, a, a, a clinical product to commercial stage, uh, going through that uh, stage one and stage two, and then uh, establishing a stage three uh, in a couple of companies that I worked in the, in the Boston area. Um, so these are my experiences, and that th these doesn't these don't necessarily mean that uh, you know these are standard. But I think it it helps to take a practical standpoint of view on some of these approaches. Um, so the first thing I faced is uh, is insufficient process knowledge. Now now mind you that I this was in a clinical stage company, which was at a point where uh, stage three results were expected. Uh, and they were expected to be positive, and we were planning for a pre-approval inspection by the FDA. So I was hired with the idea of taking this program onto commercial. Um, 
I, I, I remember like going through the FDA's uh, process violation guidance, attending a couple of seminars and, and then sitting with my PD counterpart in the process design, process development counterpart saying, all right, give me the CQA, CPP, QTPP and uh, you know, all those nice things. And he's looking at me with a, with a, with a, with a blank face saying, here, we don't have that knowledge yet. Uh, so I think this is, this is a challenge. I'm not saying that everyone would face it, but uh, you know, if you're trying to move fast for some of these products, uh, this could be a challenge. Uh, the other is limited number of batches at commercial scale, right? Um, so uh, uh, you, you have what you have and you're going to move ahead with this. Uh, how do you tackle these kind of issues? Uh, the next one is business objectives, corporate priorities, right? As I said, we were a clinical stage company. It was very important for us to, to meet our, our goals of uh, launching uh, upon quick uh, phase three results. These things are pretty important for companies when, when you're surviving on, on these kind of uh, results, right? If it's the first product, we have never been into co commercial stage uh, and now we're going to get a phase three results. We want to file quickly. We want to do a PPQs quickly. We want to file quickly. Uh, we do not have the time to set and do all the stage one activities that, that are probably expected, right? Um, the other issue is cross-functional knowledge uh, on the new PV guidance. Now, granted, this is like 2014, 2015 timeframe where I was dealing with this. Um, the new guidance was out by two or three years. Adoption was there, but it wasn't there that much. So across the board in my team, like my quality counterpart, my process design, my process development counterpart, were they all on board with what was required, right? Um, and then the statistical expertise. So, uh, uh, we definitely did not have that kind of expertise, especially this is more applicable as you move towards stage uh, three CPV, as you're doing control charts, as you're doing uh, some of the capability uh, uh, indices. Um, so, so this is an area, if you do not have that expertise, you can go out and get it. There are a lot of uh, avenues for that. Uh, there are a lot of people who would help you with this kind of an approach. Uh, you don't need to go by yourself and, and start start tracking things that, that probably are not that relevant to your process. And then finally, organizational silos. So once again, um, this may be more applicable in a bigger company than a smaller biotech, but uh, it, it, if one group finishes their work and does a handover to the other group, and it doesn't quite work that way, this is a collaborative approach. The validation engineer may not have that much knowledge on the process, but that is what is required for stage one and stage two. But whereas the process development guy is not a validation person, uh, he or she may not know how to present some of this data, um, and so that is that is uh, uh, some of the issues I faced. Um, uh, I, I just brought uh, Tara's slide back from CNQ to just give you an idea. Uh, the ideal approach would be right that you have your product uh, risk assessments, your CQA, CPPs, and then you would move towards equipment and system qualification. Uh, but sometimes it doesn't happen that way, right? This stuff may not have happened when you've qualified your equipment. Uh, and so this stuff may happen somewhere over here. Uh, and so that clams up your time frame of, of, of your stage one and stage two PPQ, right? So, so my, bear in mind that, that some of these may happen in parallel as you're working towards your equipment and system qualification. Um, so, uh, the, one of the other important things I want to point out is uh, during your PPQ, uh, we had the highest scrutiny and our highest uh, effort amongst the team in determining the number of PPQ batches, right? The standard question, will you do three? Will you do 30? What, what is it, right? Um, so Tara did mention a little bit about the different approaches to determining the number of PPQ batches. Um, the most common one that, that I've seen people do is a risk-based determination. You can use a statistical determination, but at that stage, maybe you don't have that much knowledge to, to use statistics. And some folks I know in the industry have said that they've tried doing it. Uh, at times it throws out a ridiculous number, like you know 18 batches, right, or 25 batches, right? You don't have um, 25 batches to PPQ, right? So, it, it's important to understand FDA's expectation. If you remember my first, a few of my first slides, uh, the process qualification establishes initial state of control. Uh, with that in mind, we looked at our process. We looked at the process complexity. 
uh, and we made uh, qualitative assessments and we documented them in our, in our rationale section, uh, in our PPQ and in our, in our VMP about how uh, complex our process is. Like for example, we didn't have any uh, reformulations or concentration changes of our process or any uh, uh, filtration uh, uh, down the line. And so based on that, we said our process is fairly robust and straightforward. Um, historical experience again, and it's demonstrated capability. If you made a lot of batches in the initial clinical stage or, uh, or your engineering stage, uh, you can probably use that. Uh, extent of uh, IPC in process controls. This is probably the most uh, robust thing that we did in my experience, because as I told you, we were a startup biotech. We didn't have that many batches. We didn't have, didn't have that much knowledge, but our IPCs were very robust. Uh, you know, wherever feasible uh, during the PPQ, that is stage two, and then stage 3A, we put uh, IPCs in place. Uh, for example, hold time uh, for our product, right? Um, so I remember we used to have like a TOR or time outside of refrigeration, or like 18 hours or something. Um, so at every stage of holding, we, we collected those samples during our PPQ. Remember, the PPQ is, is a normal process but enhanced sampling, right? So, so we did. We had a robust IPC, uh, and based on that, uh, we were able to say that our process risk is low. Um, and then inherent material variability, we had two main API suppliers. In fact, we had one API supplier initially, and then uh, while we were qualifying, like before that, we, we decided to add a second one. Um, so we decided to do three batches of one, and we thought that that would be sufficient based on everything that we've said. Um, interestingly, it was good for one agency, but it wasn't good for the other one. So we, we got the EMA approval, but the um, FDA wanted us to do additional sample, additional uh, PPQ lots for our second API supplier. And so uh, these things you would have to put all in a qualitative risk assessment um, and then determine the number of batches. Um, you can still use the bracketing and matrixing approaches for strengths and equipment trains and stuff like that. So those approaches, those traditional validation approaches are still valid. And then uh, you have to justify, as I said, the number of PPQ batches. Uh, finally, uh, it really helped if you are embarking on this process uh, and you um, and of, of, of stage one, two, and three, it would really help to establish good policies and SOPs up front. Um, in our case, what you can see, what I have over here is we had an SOP or a policy, depending on how your company calls it, uh, for each stage, stage one, stage 2A, stage three, uh, stage 2B PPQ, and stage three for CPV. Um, and I remember during the pre-approval inspection, the FDA asked us, do you have a plan for stage three? Uh, and, and we said yes, and we and we didn't have that many lots. We didn't have lots at that time because we were still not approved, right? Um, and so I did present the, the SOP to them. It was like a two-page SOP, but it gave them the idea that we are prepared for commercial for stage three. So I think it's very important that you establish some of these criteria in, in procedures. Uh, and then, then the PPQs, them, uh, the, the VMPs themselves, you would need a VMP for your PPQs and, um, and then the individual protocols. So very important to establish your documentation structure upfront. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all of them. We've touched base on, on some of these, uh, pretty much all of these, uh, the QTPP. So once again, it helps to have a clear stage one deliverables um, and stage two deliverables and, and stage three ones. Uh, if you have that uh, uh, written down, uh, it's easier for the team to follow. Uh, some of the important ones, the manufacturing process design, this was probably a key document for us because this is where our PFD, our process designers, uh, this is where all the ranges are, the normal operating range, the acceptable operating range, uh, the in-process tests. This is the basis for a lot of stuff in stage two. Once again, the continuum of process validation, what you do in stage one is applicable in stage two and stage three. Um, and then QRM, the quality risk assessments, you may remember some of the slides uh, that Tara had uh, about QRM principles, uh, some of the slides about control strategy, strategy 
Uh, all of those things are pretty crucial when you're deciding on stage two PP, PPQ, and all of that comes from stage one PD deliverables. So there are, the risk assessment, you would start in stage one. You may need to update them at stage two or beyond, but definitely you would start at stage one. Uh, and then the process control strategy, this is another key document uh, which will help you as you move forward. Uh, finally, the process VMP, this happens uh, at the cusp of stage one to stage two. You, you start writing your VMP and you put everything in there. Um, some of the guidances, in fact, clearly state what is expected of you of a VMP, a validation master plan, a process validation. So it's important you get this out of the door in stage one. Uh, stage two PPQs, um, you obviously have the computer system, equipment, utilities, IQ, QPQs, or if you're using the term verification, um, you know, those ought to happen in stage two, uh, it's stage 2A to be specific. Uh, your cleaning validation stuff, your, your analytical method validation, uh, coach and shipping, if that's part of your, pro uh, of your process for your product, um, all of this ought to happen in stage two. Uh, and then the PPQ protocol itself. This is this is where all your enhanced sampling, your CQAs, your CPPs come together to demonstrate that your process performs as expected. And then finally, a key thing is the stage 3A monitoring plan. Uh, and this is what I was saying when the FDA were there for a, for a pre-approval inspection, they were asking us, hey, what, what is your plan? So this is an important stage two deliverable. It ought to happen at stage two as to what you're going to do in stage 3A. Um, at least what is your plan? You may, you may make changes as you, as you go along, but the stage three and monitoring plan uh, is, is pretty critical. Uh, what you're going to monitor in terms of CQAs and CPPs uh, and, and, and do statistical analysis on uh, will happen over here in stage three A plan. Uh, stage three, finally, you are in commercial, you got your approval, uh, you ought to have your process and product monitoring plan. So, so going back to that uh, stage 3A plan that modifies into this process and product monitoring plan. Um, established for us, it was established of the completion of 30th lot. Um, you know, um, there is some statistical significance to that and, and Tara can talk about that if you guys are interested. But, but at the point of the 30th lot for our process, uh, we would start establishing limits, uh, the upper control limits, the lower control limits, the mean, uh, and until that point, we're just collecting data, uh, or you can call it the enhanced sampling stage uh, and, and at that point. Uh, and then finally, uh, establishment of control charts. Uh, there are Nelson rules uh, uh, as control charts that we used, uh, and the risk-based response to these. So this is getting into the nitty-gritty of, of stage three and, and ongoing commercial manufacturing process control. Remember, stage two was initial state of control, stage three is uh, ongoing state of control. Um, in terms of deliverables, we used to have a CPV report. Uh, if you guys remember, Tara was mentioning at least an annual, uh, the expectation is that you do it on an annual basis, but but the uh, off late, the idea is that you do it at a higher frequency than annual. Um, so we used to do it quarterly. Uh, it, you don't need to do it that way. It depends on, on your process and your volume of your product that goes out of the door. Uh, but for us, it was a quarterly basis. Uh, and here we, we we gave the status on each monitored parameter and the action items. Uh, what did we see in terms of the signals? Is there something we need to do? Uh, not every time we needed to do something. Um, and also we kept on evaluating and, and upgrading our plans. Uh, I remember uh, like for something like pH, and, and if I go back to Tara's slides, uh, she mentioned about something that you're deliberately controlling, right? Uh, so pH in our case, was a CQA, was a release criteria, and we were tracking it uh, for a statistical analysis in our CPV, but we probably didn't need to because it's something that we were controlling. So it was one of those sort of meaningless chart, if you will, uh, because we were controlling it, and so we knew exactly what it would be uh, uh, at, at the point of release. So, so these are some of the uh, deliverables. Um, I think I might have gone a little bit over, so I'm sorry, but uh, I think that covers our talk. and. Uh, and open it up for Q&A. Thank you. Thank you both of you for an excellent presentation. Uh, going into details, in fact, we were waiting for a really long time. We have a series to some experts come and talk about process validation. 
So thank you, thank you so much. Uh, there are several questions and uh, let's take a few of them. Uh, just let me get a guess, you know, of what what could be this. So one of the things which is uh, coming out uh, in these questions is how would you differentiate, you know, you have gone through your slides in annual product review and the stage 3B uh, of the process validation. Isn't there overlap in uh, in those things? Okay, or you want to take that? It, either one yeah. of us can, but okay, or go ahead. Yeah, so I'll I'll give you what we used to do, and 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 this was again my limited experience. Tara can give a more broader uh, what everyone else is doing, right? So initially, when we started, when when we started doing these, we just we established a quarterly reporting that we'll do the dashboards that we created uh, and we did realize that they were not aligned with our APQR with that annual product review so the next time we sort of did it twice I think but then we aligned it in such a way it, it's just to, to us it was just a practical approach I don't know if there is a there's a regulatory expectation but Tara can touch base on that but for us it was just a practical approach do it in a way that it coincides with your APR uh, and then when that was a post product eventually we got other products as well and so it was very important because it's a time consuming exercise so we began a quarter before the apr was due and and our, our last assessment would have the annual review would have been done by that time of all our parameters that gave us about three months to do our apr so that i don't you. know if you want to add to it yeah, yeah, it's definitely there's definitely overlap, and in fact, it's more of a it's a, as Kaior was describing, it's more of a, a business situation um, than a regulatory one. You you don't want to do redundant work, so so you want to efficiently monitor in general both annual product review and CPV mo are monitoring programs. You you want to you want to somehow marry them. You don't want yes. multiple people doing the same thing. Um, and, and so it becomes more of a, how will your organization figure this out so that you don't do redundant work? It's not a regulatory, there's no regulatory requirements. They want to, annual product review is a regulatory requirement. CPV is a regulatory requirement. But how you marry those two together, that the agencies just want to show, are you able to show your process remains in a state of control? Annual product review has those additional things like product complaints and everything, and that can be part of your CPV program too. It's just a business, it's a business challenge for you how to how to marry the two. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, then there, is, uh, there are questions on, uh, you know, the statistical samplings, the number of batches, both in stage two and stage three. Uh, KU, you, you dealt uh, with uh, stage two PPQ, the number of samples and other things, but can you, can any one of you go into more details about, especially for the stage three, when you're doing continuous process verification, how, you know, what is the kind of sampling, what tools uh, you, you would uh, apply? Yeah, maybe I'll let Tara handle that. Uh, I think she might have a better answer than okay. me. Okay, yes, before before I go into stage three, just very quickly about stage two. Okay, you were talked about a risk-based approach to the number of PPQ batches. Indeed, that is the common way the industry has moved toward. Uh, they've moved away from a statistical approach. I'm a statistician, so obviously I love statistics. I do not love statistics for determining the number of PPQ batches. There's lots of reasons why I, as a statistician, do not recommend that approach. I recommend a, the type of risk-based approach that Kayor described in his example. Um, as far as stage three, you know, the number of batches. So you have to think about, do I am I talking about intra-batch sampling in stage three, or am I talking about inter? If I'm talking about intra-batch, you may still need um, to evaluate samples, multiple samples within a batch because you really still don't understand um, that where, where, where across a batch do you have variability. You really need to be able to show from a combination of data 
and scientific justification that you understand that intra-batch variability and and so from how many samples you need you know you need a good representative sample beginning middle and end as i said top middle and bottom that's a scientific decision where you need to sample um, the total number of samples depends on what what you'll do with that data what type of statistical statement you want to make do you want to make a capability statement do i want to do variance components what 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 the statistically speaking what is the question I'm trying to answer with this data will determine the number of samples that you need. As far as the number of batches to take those samples, you can, if you move into stage 3A, you can say, well, from a logistical standpoint, what makes sense? Well, uh, my first campaign will be six batches. Okay, that makes sense to have a protocol we follow for the first campaign, six batches after the six batches. It's totally okay for you to evaluate the data at that point say this is how our what our variability looks like from this point forward we will no longer continue to take enhanced sampling so you know sampling always depends on what is the question you're trying to answer and in addition to that logistical considerations what makes sense scientific considerations what makes sense what's a representative sample all those questions become part of determination of a sample size thank you uh, I know it's a it's a complex thing determining the sample size. Uh, sure, depends it on is. So, so, uh, depends on so many uh, so many parameters. Uh, in one of your slides, uh, I think Tara, you made a thing a comment or Tara or Kayo that concurrent validation is no more acceptable in the FDA guidance. They have specifically said that. Any scientific reason for that? I mean, we have done concurrent validation for yes. so many years. Yeah, let, let, let me clarify, and then I'll let Tara add to it. But um, concurrent validation should be rarely used, is the language. Um, yes. So uh, it, it isn't that you, you cannot do it. You, you have to justify that approach. Um, and in the case of the example that I was reading, I was, I was looking at the warning letter. Um, I, I, I do not know what the product was, right? And, you know, some of that information is, is redacted, right? But uh, what the FDA said that in your case, uh, we do not buy in. In, in. in a nutshell, if you want me to say, the FDA said we do not buy in that concurrent validation is a good approach because you've not understood your process. Uh, th those were the words that they said before that statement. Um, and if you go back to my slide, I, I deliberately kept that sentence before. Furthermore, they said this should be rarely used. So I like to clarify out there that that I, I you know that you, you can use it, uh, but but the, the words were rarely used. So rarely uh, used. I'll, I'll let Tara add to it. Uh, the the idea is um, now that PPQ um, should be a demonstration. That's it. It is a demonstration of process understanding and a good control strategy. The idea of concurrent validation is. I still might be learning, right? I, 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 haven't, I haven't said in advance what my acceptance criteria as far as the number of batches and the number of samples and what I expect to see. I haven't set that in advance. I am going to validate, validate and make decisions as I go. It's, the idea is it's not, it's not a simple demonstration. If you're not ready to go forward with uh, three batches and everything you know is going to turn out right, then the idea is you should not be going into PPQ. That being said, um, with some products that have um, accelerated approval, like a breakthrough therapy product, they will allow concurrent. That's one of those cases, those rare cases that they will allow concurrent validation. But that is something that you will have discussed with the agency in advance. Let's say you know it's a it's an un, a, a, a serious unmet medical need. You have breakthrough therapy status. The idea is get this to the patients as soon as possible. You will have decide you will have discussed with the FDA or the other agencies potentially that um, depending on your market, of course, um, that you will do you you will do concurrent validation. That might be one case where it's allowed, but that will be pre-approved. That will be pre-discussed. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. So let's take, you know, we're coming to an end of our webinar time. So let's take the last two questions. <laughs> One is about uh, qualification of equipment. 
uh, you know, you mentioned the ISP guide, new guide, which has come for commissioning and qualification. And we had webinars on that. Uh, we had people who had written those guides come and uh, discuss that. Now, that guide talks about critical quality attributes and critical process parameters to be used during commissioning and qualification. But like Keir, you mentioned in one of your slides that many times when you're doing that, you know, it's much early. I mean, you're doing qualification earlier and the product comes afterwards. So how, how do you handle that, that particular thing? Yeah, uh, maybe I can I can give an answer and then let Tara, Tara add to it. So uh, most of my experience has been um, because product is going into human consumption, right? So the equipment has to be qualified, right? This is clinical stage. I've worked a lot in clinical stage companies. Um, and so IQOQs are done already. Sometimes even yes. a small PQ is done. Uh, but as you are, as you're moving into the, the stage one phase or stage two phase, as you are developing CQA CPPs, or as you are uh, developing a robust set of them, you had an initial set, and now you are sort of fine combing it. Um, you may want to go back and reevaluate your PQ. That is, wow. we've gone back and done that on a few occasions, and on a few occasions we actually didn't do a PQ. <laughs> we did an IQ and OQ, and we left it at that. The OQ was a pretty thorough OQ, so we didn't feel the need to do a PQ. Uh, but then we went back and did a PQ on some of the critical equipment. Um, and and so we uh, sort of didn't have to do that in our in our PPQ protocol. Uh, and, and one or two occasions we've actually even done that work in the PPQ. Um, I would not recommend it. I would want a clean slate. Uh, I would want my IQ OQ PQs to be separate from my PPQ. Uh, but that's again an approach that you can take. But definitely it happens a lot where IQ OQs are already done, yes. and, and then you develop your CQA, and it's just perfectly fine. Uh, that's the way it goes. So, you know. Okay. Yes, Sarah, Sarah you'd like to add anything? Um, no, I think that we. I think that's covered very well, and and I know we're coming up on time, and there was still another question you had. Um, so let's go to the to the next question. Okay. So this is the last one, uh, Tara. You did mention that for legacy products, uh, you you don't start with the stage one, which is. Uh, the development but you go directly to the stage two can you give more on that because it is a little brief your slide uh how how should people because there are many people you know this uh, guidance has come in 2011 and then 2015 and products are there for last 20 years and if they have to apply this guidance to that what, what do they do if you could just elaborate any both of you uh, yeah so so for a legacy product you go into stage three Right, you go right into your um, uh, ongoing monitoring program uh, and you'll do a baseline assessment. So you'll grab historical data um, and uh, uh, look at the capability of that particular product. Uh, if you need to determine whether you need to evaluate and trend critical process parameters, you may not even have, it might be a legacy product that before the terms critical process parameter was even identified right yes, so you yes. you have to do you can do a historical risk assessment to say um do i need based on the capability of this process let's say it's a process that occasionally you have out of spec and you really don't know why that might drive you actually into some elements of process design as far as experimentation um, you may want to start trending those things that you think are your critical process parameters that's on one side on another side, a legacy product may have been manufactured for the past 20 years with never a problem. In that case, you'd say, look, as far as risk is concerned, all I need to do is continuing, I'll just monitor the critical quality attributes. I don't need to monitor any parameters. There's no, there, I, my resources are spent better elsewhere. So you really, again, it's a risk-based assessment on those legacy products of how much do I need enhanced, do I need any 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 enhanced sampling? Um, that, that can be, there can be issues with that um, as far as product um, that's already marketed. Um, you know, do I need to do some experiments? Um, do I, you know, that, that that's when you have a, a product that's not behaving well. Um, you need to do more work. Event, you may in fact need to do a PPQ on a product 
that has low capability, meaning you've had points outside of specification. You may need to go through the whole process on the on the opposite end of that spectrum. You have a process that all you need to do is met, is monitor the CQAs. It's a risk based assessment. Thank you. Okay, you have anything to add to that? No, no, I think that that's pretty good. Yeah, no, I don't have to add here. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, both of you, for excellent presentation and answering so many questions. Thank you, delegates, for joining us today in such large numbers. I'm sure you would have enjoyed this. Uh, the recording of this will be available on our website and on our YouTube channel. And before we tell a bit goodbye to our delegates, I will again hand it over to you to have your concluding remarks uh, uh, on this. Over to both of you. Maybe Tara, you can. Um, yeah, I'd like to thank uh, everybody for joining. I, I saw that you, you did have a very large group um, the number of attendees, so I appreciate that, and and um, I'm happy to um, be able to to um, talk about lifecycle process validation. Um, I'm always one to say uh, we don't follow these guide. We we can't just think of these guidances as something we must do for compliance. These guidances and the fundamentals and premises and principles of them are good business, uh, give us a good business focus. They are the way, if we weren't pharmaceutical manufacturers, if we manufactured cars or TVs or, 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 or silicon chips, these sort of principles are those that we would follow for those products too. They make good business sense. And if we imply them appropriately, we have competitive, you will have competitive advantage um, because you are, you are manufacturing most efficiently and effectively, in addition to, of course, being compliant. That, inclu that includes the statistics that you do. <laughs> Makes, they make good business sense. Okay, Kaior. Um, so, yeah, so uh, three, three quick things, right? Uh, number one, um, that don't fret on the number of PPQ batches. Um, you, uh, you know, it's an initial state of control. Um, this, the stage three and the whole thing together uh, is, is, the, is, the, is the whole process validation. So um, I, I've still seen, a lot, I'm still seeing a lot of people do three batches. Uh, whether it is three or four or five or seven, uh, the, you know, the, some some folks are done. Even, even I've done in the past where we would do a risk assessment. Uh, high risk uh, would be seven, medium risk would be five, uh, and low risk would be three. So anything less than three is, you know, obviously uh, you're not talking, right? So, uh, but so you could have that kind of an approach. Uh, don't fret too much on it. Uh, focus on the enhanced sampling. Uh, that I think is the key. Uh, rather than worrying too much about the number of PPQ batches. Uh, I know that's a hot topic, but you still can get through that. Um, um, and then, uh, uh, you know, second point is uh, that, that when I started the industry, I asked the question, right? And I got like one run, it works, two, it's a fluke, and three, it's validated, right? Uh, so those days are gone now, right? So, Absolutely. Uh, right, and so it's it's a continuum. Uh, and also don't put too much on stage one activities uh, because sometimes you may not have that. You use your QRMs, uh, your risk assessments and your in, uh, enhanced sampling and your IPCs to, to tackle that. And then final thing I'd like to say is some of your presentations there at ISP India, I think have been amazing. I've actually now started, I've subscribed to it and I've gone back and, and looked at some of them. So, so I appreciate that. I never knew like I could even do that. Like I go to a different affiliate and and see some of the presentations. So so I, I think it's uh, kudos to you guys for for doing this. So, so thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kehur. Thank you, Chara, for this excellent presentation and coming and sharing your knowledge uh, knowledge with us. Thank you so much. Thank you, delegates, for joining in such large numbers. Please do tune in next week. Today we spoke about manufacturing process. Next week, we'll be talking about life cycle management of analytical methods. Please do join in. Have a good evening. Stay safe. Follow the guidelines issued by your local government. And bye-bye now. Thank you, Thank Tara. You. Thank you, Kevin. Bye. Bye-bye.